At Northrop Grumman, innovation isn't just an idea. It's a way of life. The value of performance. Northrop Grumman. I am so pleased to be here with you today, and I wish I could bring a submarine along <laughs> and take all of us out there into the ocean instead of just talking about it. But I'm going to start with just the three-minute film that will maybe, in a way, transport us there. I am grateful to the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, for putting this together. It sort of describes how I found my way into the deep blue sea. The first thing that I, I could sense as we got close to the sea was you could just hear this faint roar of the waves crashing on the beach. And as we got closer, I could smell the ocean. And then finally, we'd come over the dunes and I could see the ocean, that great blue green expanse. And then racing over the dunes, you could jump in and touch the ocean. Well, I can still feel that, that exhilaration. But what has held my interest is life in the ocean, those big horseshoe crabs that crawl up on the beach along the Jersey shore in the summer. It's a starfish that come ashore once in a while and then they get washed back into the sea. It's the seaweed and the smell of the ocean. We're explorers, are little kids who never grew up. They keep that same sense of of discovery that everything is a miracle and everything truly is. The whole nature of exploration is the unknown. The whole incentive is to peel back the layers of what we don't know. I regard this as the sweet spot in time because until right about now, we could not see ourselves in perspective in the universe, and we may be the only creatures ever to have the capacity to do that. Now we know that we're changing the nature of nature. Now we know that what we're doing is changing the ocean. Our lives depend on the existence of the ocean. That message has yet to reach all people everywhere, so that's a big challenge. People far inland, many don't realize that with every breath they take, they're connected to the ocean. With every drop of water they drink, they're connected to the ocean. But they may not, never touch the ocean, but the ocean touches them. We have a planet blessed with an ocean, and that we don't have all the answers yet. There's still plenty of room for kids to find discoveries that no one in all of the history of humans has seen or understood what any little kid has a chance to go and find out and then tell all their friends to make a difference for the world. Knowing is the key. So how could we not explore the ocean? So. <laughs> Building on Dr. Collins' comments about this being an extraordinary time in history, things that we now know that we could not know, could not understand when I was a kid, when Dr. Collins was a kid, when, when my parents were kids, during all preceding history, most of what we now understand about the universe, about our own bodies, about the ocean, simply was not known, and we did not have the ways and means of finding out. But you have come along at this magical, pivotal point in time, maybe just in time, to be able to turn things around from a time when there are lots of reasons why people are concerned about the fate of this little blue speck in the universe. You know, there are a lot of unfriendly options out there. The universe is beautiful inspiring, magnificent, and we need to learn everything we can about it. But we also need to learn about this part of the universe, our home, 
the little blue planet that floats around in the midst of all the rest. I can't wait to see what new information is going to come about to better understand the big questions. Who are we? Where do we come from? And where are we going? I think we should really celebrate the knowledge that we've gained about our sister planets, including Mars, the most likely place for us to set up housekeeping other than the moon, other than Earth. <laughs> but think of what we have to do. The atmosphere there is mostly carbon dioxide, not a very friendly place. You have to take your life support system with you. There is water, but not a lot. There apparently was water and ocean in large quantity, a lot of water once. But even now, looking at our own planet, if you imagine, if you take all the water that exists, all the lakes, the rivers, the streams, the ocean, all the water that you have in your bodies, all the groundwater, the clouds, you put it into a ball and that's all there is. If you spread it over the planet, fill up the oceans, the average depth, two and a half miles, maximum seven miles. Seems like a lot of water until you look at it like this. Everything that we care about is dependent on the existence of that little blue ball of water spread over the planet, in the skies, in the rivers, lakes, and streams. Now we know, now we have a way to know. By getting up high in the sky and deep in the ocean, we have the computer technologies that enable us to connect the dots, to take the now seven billion minds on the planet and communicate in ways that we couldn't imagine when I was a kid. Much of this is possible because we've tapped into fossil fuels, especially the oil and gas reserves that are still powering our civilization in ways that, that none before our, those who live now could possibly imagine. Having access to the energy that we've consumed that took millions of years to form has benefited civilization, has given us an edge over all of those who preceded us, the gift of knowledge, of knowing what we couldn't know if we did not have satellites up in the sky, given us comforts, given us the capacity to use equipment, mighty microscopes, mighty telescopes, many things that without that source of energy, we would be far behind the curve. Now we know that there's a downside. There's a cost that we did not know about in 1980, we started actually measuring the amount of ice in the Arctic and have watched the steady and rather alarming decline of ice at both poles. Bad news for polar bears and walruses and other creatures, the people of the Arctic, who have come to rely on having a steady ice cover during the winter and a pretty good ice cover in the summer, but now that summer ice is melting such that good news for shipping Bad news for a lot of things that we care about. Now we know the cost in terms of coral reefs, that warm layer of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, one of the great greenhouse gases warming the planet, causing a shift in systems that have been developing over many millions of years, including coral reefs, experiencing unprecedented bleaching where they lose the the algae that live in their tissues and they go dead white and sometimes they go dead because their partner algae that provides sustenance for them and perhaps some oxygen as well, they simply are not equipped to prosper as they were when they're intact. We're seeing the consequences of various kinds of effects because the climate is changing, weather is changing, more storms, more intense storms, coupled with, in some places, flooding, other places, drought. We are seeing a planet that is changing as never before in history. But the good news is we're connected. We can see these things. Imagine you lived a thousand years ago. Catastrophes were happening that would influence your life perhaps, but it's happening on the other side of the world. Now we know, now we can see with new insight and understand. Really since we began to 
to go high in the sky with satellites, with people up in the sky, and to explore our own blue planet in ways that our predecessors simply could not. And it, the stage is set right now, as never before, for you to take advantage of what has been learned through harnessing these fossil fuels, to take it the next step, and how do we move in another direction so that we can power our civilization, but without the downside. About the same time that astronauts began going up in the sky, 1969, 45 years ago, about the time I guess some of your parents were being born, I had a chance to actually use astronaut-like equipment to explore the ocean. And again, I think what those who preceded me couldn't imagine doing this, that it, because we did not know how to access either the skies above or the depths below, and we're learning all the time. Actually, we've progressed further in going high in the sky. We've invested in aviation and aerospace, but we've been neglecting the ocean, and it's costing us dearly. We can't even find a 777 aircraft when it goes down in the ocean, because we don't know much about what's there in the first place. We have better maps of the moon and Mars and Jupiter than we do of what lies under the sea. There's lots for you to do. We're just getting started. Now, in this high in the sky, for the last few decades, people have actually been living in space. Starting in 1970, I had a chance to start living underwater. I've done it 10 times. Imagine getting into a little underwater apartment, if you will, like a trailer, and setting up housekeeping on the reef, where you can sleep with a fish. You can look out at a little window and watch the fish watching you. You can eat, sleep, do whatever inside, just as astronauts do in their space station, but only a few lucky astronauts get to take spacewalks. Aquanauts only use their home underwater as a home base and actually spend most of the time, when they're not sleeping or eating, outside, using the ocean as a laboratory in that great liquid atmosphere that holds most of life on Earth. All life requires water. No water, no life. No blue, no green. No water, no us. And 97% of Earth's water is ocean. What are we thinking by not exploring the ocean and getting acquainted with the greatest diversity of life? It's there in the sea, the history of life. You can see sometimes you just get a bucket of water and look at the creatures who live there. You can see greater variations on the theme of life out there in a, in a bucket of water than you can in all of the land creatures put together. It's so cool to be able to slip through that, that mirror, that liquid door, separating you from the inside of your underwater laboratory to the reef beyond, and then to just go out there and get acquainted with the sponges whose ancestry goes back more than half a billion years. You know, we are so fortunate to be able to actually do this the, on this, this era that we share. The greatest time to be alive in all of human history. We're the beneficiaries of all that intelligence, all that tinkering, all of that that was invested in giving us the tools that we now have to answer those questions. Where have we come from? Where are we going? And maybe most importantly, how are we going to get there? Well, part of it is with little submarines, so simple to drive that even a scientist can do it. I'm living proof. If you don't like to drive yourself, you can go with a chauffeur. There are lots of little submarines, but not nearly enough. I long for having a day when there is Hertz Rent-A-Sub, so you could just go get the little vehicle of your choice and take off into Chesapeake Bay or the Gulf of Mexico or dive under the ice in the Arctic. It's coming, it'll happen perhaps on your watch. Maybe you will be building the submarines or using the submarines as observers, witnesses, and reporters on the state of the world at this most important time in history. Now, you have to understand that most of life on Earth lives in the dark, not just in Washington, D.C. It's a, did I say, oh, I did, well, I didn't mean to say that. Um, <laughs> 
Ah. Go a thousand feet down, and it's dark, except for bioluminescence, the light that creatures form with their own living light. But below that, the average depth, two and a half miles. Average depth, maximum depth, seven miles. But it was not until 1960 that two people, Jacques Picard and Don Walsh, made a round trip journey to the deepest part of the ocean. Now, it is the round trip coming back that counts. It's so easy to go down. It's like taking off in an airplane. It's the landing that really is the tricky part. To the right in this image, you'll see a vehicle that in 2012 took, well, I'm not quite sure what to call him. Is he a scientist? Is he an engineer? Is he an artist? Is he a polymath? Whatever he is, he directs cool movies like Titanic and Avatar and Terminator. I don't know, long list. But James Cameron is also somebody who hasn't quite grown up. He does what kids do, asks questions. He then follows through and makes things happen. He's an artist, I suppose, but he's also a very skilled engineer working with engineers, working with scientists to come up with how do you build a vehicle capable of withstanding pressure. 16,000 pounds per square inch at the deepest part of the ocean, seven miles down. And he was the one who actually verified exactly how deep the ocean is. Can you imagine until he went down in 2012? We didn't actually know to the same degree of accuracy that we know the height of Mount Everest how deep the ocean is. But he came back with careful calculations based on some numbers using equipment that didn't exist in 1960 and came back with something that now the Geogra National Geographic is incorporating into their new atlases, the refined measurements. But it isn't just water. It isn't just the joy of being down, cruising around in the darkness, seeing little lights flash. It's getting to know creatures who live there and what they do, discovering chemosynthesis, the alternative to photosynthesis in terms of fixing carbon, making food that generates a lot of action in the deep sea. We're just beginning to appreciate the importance of understanding and being there in the ocean and putting it all together to couple what we know about photosynthesis and driving carbon capture and oxygen release, knowing how the world works, knowing the chemistry of the earth. One thing, for sure, getting into the ocean means you get to, you know, get acquainted with the creatures who live there. Most people only see fish when they're on their plate or in a market somewhere or at the end of a hook, not very happy. But as a diver, and any of you can take the plunge, face masks, fins, maybe someday a submarine, but whatever it takes to explore the ocean, to see creatures with new eyes, to understand how their lives and our lives intersect, that the DNA of these strange and wonderful creatures that live in the ocean or that live on land but not human, that we share a lot in common. Of course we do with other humans, but the idea that we're just beginning to understand how all life connects and that what we do to life in the sea, what we do to life on land really affects us wherever we live. We're on the edge of great discoveries. Now we know that there are other ways that you can appreciate shrimp, not just steamed or cooked or fried or whatever it is, popcorn shrimp, but, but there are many attributes of these creatures and many variations on the theme of shrimp and other forms of life on Earth that have values beyond what we think of as practical, useful, edible, or pr product value. Consider the Consider the krill in Antarctica. Humans didn't have any use for krill until fairly recently when we could get to where krill live. Now, starting in about 1980, access to Antarctica began to be relatively secure. It's still a big deal going to Antarctica. But many ships now go there to capture krill and deep sea fish that never felt the bite of a hook or a net until the last 20 or 30 years. Pristine populations in the sea that we are taking for oil, 
squeezing the oil out of krill, squeezing the oil out of little fish, feeding them to cows and chickens and pigs that really would probably not like to eat shrimp if they were given a choice, since their main diet is, is plants. But consider what happens to those creatures who do eat krill. The penguins, they're having a harder and harder time finding lunch and breakfast and dinner. Oh, we should do everything we can to make sure that in the future your kids are going to get to know penguins and krill and great whales and all the other creatures that make this planet such a wonderful one. But unlike what we've done to the land, where we have finally gotten to the point where we have said we're not going to commercially extract birds from the air, although we did right up until kind of the middle of the 20th century, taking wildlife in large quantities from the land. And now we are using new technologies that are so useful to us in so many ways, but applying it to extracting life from the sea, literally draining life from the sea. Millions of tons of wildlife extracted every year. Now, engineers look at tuna, bluefin tuna, and they sigh with envy because we don't know how to capture the efficiency that bluefins do when they speed through the water, but presently, their numbers are precariously small. As chief scientist at NOAA in 1990, I got a message across my desk that 90% of the bluefin tuna in the North Atlantic Ocean were already gone in 20 years. We're so good at catching them because they taste so good that we have applied the same method of extracting them globally. And globally, bluefins and other tunas, and in fact, many of the big fish are gone. And it's happened in my lifetime. Now, in your lifetime, perhaps this can be turned around. And we need to start right now to look at these creatures with new eyes. Sharks used to be considered the biggest, baddest fish in the sea, but now we know that we have the capacity to do to them what we've done to many of the other fish. We know how to kill them. The question is, can we learn how to make peace with the ocean, with the creatures who live there, to respect them for other values? That's what's beginning to happen, just as we did on the land, making peace with wildlife on the land, with birds, with water, now in the ocean as well. We have, have mostly achieved that with whales. We killed them right up until 1986, commercially. But that was the year that a moratorium was placed on the commercial taking of whales. You can still find places where whale can be sold to eat, but mostly we look at them with new eyes, other values. It isn't just what we're taking out of the ocean that's causing alarm, it's what we're putting into it. <laughs> it's things you don't see so much, like the sewage that dumps into the ocean and changes the chemistry on that front, but it's also masses of plastic that, when Dr. Collins was a kid, when I was, well, I say sometimes we come from the pre-plasticozoic, when no plastics really existed in the same degree that we now have. And I love plastics. They, they are so important to our lives, but single-use plastics and the disposal of them is causing huge problems in the ocean. 20% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from Prochlorococcus, and much more comes from other forms of plankton in the sea. Life in the ocean is powered by photosynthesis and chemosynthesis. Most of life on the land is powered by photosynthesis, and we enjoy the benefits of the oxygen that is generated. But more than half of the oxygen comes from the sea, those little photosynthetic organisms that not only generate oxygen, but also provide food for the tiny creatures that prosper in the sea. And they feed on phytoplankton. And in turn, they feed small fish that in turn become bigger fish, and they feed larger fish, and they feed whales and dolphins. It's a long and twisted pathway from sunlight to plants to get to a tuna fish. To get to a cow, it takes about 20 pounds of plants. To get to a pound of chicken, about two pounds of plants. To get to a pound of 10-year-old tuna, top of the food chain, it may take tens of thousands of pounds of plants to make a single pound 
of tuna that goes into your sandwich. Look at this image of the world. This is something that people in the 20th century made up, deciding to claim parts of the ocean for their nations, including this nation. There's more United States that is blue than is land. We have an exclusive economic zone declared in 1982 that now magnifies the reach that we have to take care or to do whatever with the ocean. And half of the ocean beyond that is owned by everybody. The high seas, the global commons. No nation owns half the world, the blue part, the high seas. Of that area, about 3% has some form of protection where Prochlorococcus, where squids and small fish are safe. Here are the problems, you know? Lots of issues that we have to deal with as never before. But as never again, there's reason for hope because we're empowered with knowledge. You too can wear a t-shirt with Prochlorococcus on it. You too can get acquainted with life in the sea that have never seen human beings before. You too can go out and help haul in some of the trash that has been allowed to flow into the sea. You can join kids in Hong Kong who are pledging to save sharks. You can go out and get acquainted with jellyfish up close and personal. You can do as I have done, to sit down and just think about those big questions. And in the company of some wild creature, in this case, I met a bird who happens to be about as old as I am. When she was learning to fly, I was learning how to dive. She lives in Midway Island. She's an albatross. And every year, she and her mate come back, make a nest. And most years, they produce a single chick. She's produced a lot of offspring in her lifetime. But not too many of them, very few, in fact, have made it through the gauntlet of problems that, especially now, are facing the birds, the fish, and and us as well. This is the moment. We, and you in particular, have choices to figure out what kind of future not only do you want for you, but given the magnitude of what we now know, the decisions we make now, the next 10 years, will resonate and shape the next 10,000 years. Now, that isn't exciting. I don't know what is. You have a chance to have a magnified influence on everything that follows. If you could be born anywhere in time, choose now. You have chosen now, or maybe your parents chose for you. But here we are, and I'm delighted to be able to share a little piece of my lifetime with yours. Thank you. Thank you.